the videos? Do you need to go through them or at all or anything? You haven't looked at the videos yet? Okay. No. Okay. So um, we talked about constrained motion or dependent motion. And we explained that what it means by an example of this, you know, cords and pulleys and, you know, weights. We're going to do this example here to see how it works. And we do one more example after this. Um, based on what I mentioned in the last uh, lecture, practically, you have to relate the geometry of the motion of the particles to one another. For example, here, the motion of A, as this goes up and down, it may cause one of these pulleys go up and down, B or C or vice versa. And same with the C and B. Technically, you can move two of them and get the motion of the third one following them. It could be A and B as input, C as the output, B and C as the input or A and C doesn't matter. In this problem, it says if block A goes downward at this rate and block C goes down at this rate, we want to find the relative velocity of B respect to C. We're going to just find the velocity of B and see how the relative works. So I'm going to switch to the tablet. Uh, so is the definition of problem clear? This is how your system look like. You have the weight A goes here around this pulley. Okay, so VA is six feet per second. Is it positive or negative? Oh, negative. Negative. How did you determine it's negative? Because uh, it's going downward. It's going downward. Do you remember how we talked about or how we define the sign for these velocities. No, I don't. Okay. Here's how it goes. I'm going to explain it later if it's positive or negative as we solve this. But if we want to consider this again, we have a reference reference line. This is going to be. S A, this is going to be S B, and this will be S C, right? Now, if we consider the length of the cord, we're going to have this as one S A, right? We have two here as S B. Let me just change the colors. Right, and then we have this guy as SC, and the rest are you know these constant values that you know is going to be constant. So if I want to write that constraint equation, I'm going to go with the colors. Uh, so 
I'm going to get two, sorry, not two, one. SA, can you see that yellow thing? Yeah. Okay. Plus two SB, because we have two of them, one here and one here, right? Then plus one SC, and this will be equal to, I'm gonna take these red parts and the entire length of the cord, everything as a constant length, right? So this is our base equation. Any question about this? Now, if I wanna find velocities, I take the time derivative, you're gonna get VA plus two VB plus VC equals zero. Now, coming back to the question about if these guys are positive or negative. First of all, if you wanna say it goes down, it's gonna be negative. If you wanna use like X and Y stuff, you need to have your coordinate system, right? You need to define what is X and what is Y. It could be X and Y this way. It could be X and Y this way. It could be any other way. We even don't talk about this because here, what we deal with is not that X, Y or normal tangential directions. We talk about the change of the S values. So as A goes down, does S A become bigger or smaller? Bigger. Bigger, which means delta S A or D S A will be positive, right? And obviously, if it goes up, S A becomes smaller, delta S A becomes negative. So if it goes down, D S A is positive, therefore, this is positive. Same thing with SB and SC. So for all of them, going down is positive. Going up is negative. Does that make sense? Yes. Remember, we deal with geometry, not coordinate system. So that is why we go with this convention and this thing. So now that we understand this part, we simply substitute the values because the problem says a goes down and c goes down both of them are positive so you're going to get six plus two vb plus 18 equals zero and obviously vb is minus 12 feet per second now how we interpret minus in terms of direction of motion for B? Upward. Yes, because SB becomes smaller, so B goes upward. Now, problem asks for the relative velocity of B respect to C. We're gonna talk about relative velocity in the next section in like few minutes, but if relative velocity of one object respect to another. Now we could, we could go A or B or B or C, doesn't matter. It's gonna be VB minus VC, okay? Is minus 12, minus 18, you're gonna get minus 30. Again, this minus means what? <clears throat> means upward. upward. Which means if you are sitting, if, if the observer sits on block A, sorry, block C, that observer will see block B goes up with the speed of 30, 
feet per second, right? I'm sure you guys have experienced this in highways when you drive. When you pass a car, you go together, your relative velocity is the difference, for example, 65 minus, I don't know, 72. It's like seven mile speed difference you pass. And when you go face to face, the velocities, one of them is negative, so that the value will be added, and that's what you see, right? Any question about the whole problem? Okay, let's go back to the slides and do one more example. This is another example of constraint motion. <clears throat> the roller at A goes upward with the velocity of three feet per second. Why we call it constraint or dependent motion? <clears throat> you may realize that as I move A up and down, B has to follow that motion, right? So the motion of B depends on A and their dependence comes through this rope. So it gives the velocity and acceleration for A and wants to find the velocity and acceleration for B. The numbers are given. I let you draw the schematics. So how we solve this problem? Any suggestion? You guys can share your thought process. As I mentioned before, it doesn't have to be perfectly correct. It just shows you know, how you think about this and that's okay. Okay, let's share the screen. So this is how the problem looked like, right? I'm gonna write down the values. The problem says it's going upward with the velocity of three feet per second. So VA is three feet per second and acceleration of four feet per square second. Because acceleration is positive, it means the velocity is increasing, okay? At this moment that it shows this distance, is four feet. And the distance from center of this pulley to the wall 
is three feet and this is block B. I'm gonna ask the question again and I want you guys to give me answer, okay? So what creates connection between B and A? Uh, the, Go ahead. The pulley that the cables ran through? The cable technically and the pulley. Pulley redirects the, so the cable. How much is the length of the cable? Uh, Let's call it L, okay? Length of cable, L. And let's consider the position of B from here as SB, right? I could go from wall, but doesn't matter from wall or no wall because this part is constant, right? So I'm gonna consider the position of B from here, or maybe let's just make it simple here. Okay, if this is the position of B, how I can relate the length of the cable to position of B? If you look at it, obviously, the length of the cable is this length plus this length, right? I'm going to call this guy as L. So L, capital L, is SB plus L. Any question up to here? Now, remember, we want to relate A to B. So how I can relate L to the position of A, SA? And this is supposed to be SA. How I can replace this L with something as A? Um, three feet squared plus SA squared and then uh, square root of that or yeah, equals okay. L squared. So SB is technically, let's call this as D zero, right? I prefer to put parameters so we can substitute the numbers. The square root of SA squared plus d0 square, right? So this is the equation. And of course, this is equal to capital L. This is the equation that relates SA, SB, and the length of the cable. Remember, d0, is a fixed length, so D0 is constant, right? Now, if I want to find velocities, to find velocity, we use time derivative again. So, uh, for SA, we're going to get DS, SB DT plus DDT of the square root of SA square plus D0 square equals DDT of L, which is constant, right? So we know this guy is going to be zero. This will be VB. Do you guys remember the, the derivative of this? It's gonna be minus two SA VA. This doesn't have derivative divided by, and you're gonna have, have a half here, square root of, Is this correct? And the other side will be zero.
I think we don't have the minus. Uh, we don't have the minus. So technically, because S, let me just simply, S is, S A square is a function of S A, right? So it's derivative, so technically D S A square D T, again, we can write D S A square D S A plus D S A dt sorry plus times right and then here for the first one you're going to get two sa for the second one you're going to get sa dot which is va this is something we're going to use frequently so as i mentioned the other day you guys may want to practice this because i'm not going to write this like every time it's lengthy and and it is it's, it's kind of obvious so that's how we get to this point Right. Any question? So if we do this, then your VB oops, is simply these two cancels, this two minus SA. V A over a square root of S A square plus D zero square. We know at the position that it tells us S A is four feet and D zero is constant three feet. And V A was how much? Three feet per second. So if I substitute these numbers, I'm going to get V B as minus 2.4 feet per second. How we interpret the minus sign? How we interpret the minus sign? If we go back here, To the right. Exactly. You may see that as particle A or roller A goes up, B has to go to the right, which means SB becomes a smaller. Right? Which means its velocity is negative. Now, if I had like x and y coordinate system, velocity of v would have been positive y, velocity of a, velocity of v would have been positive x, but this is not x and y. We are dealing with geometry. We want to see how sb changes. I'm going to repeat this one more time so you guys um, know that this is not based on the uh, positive, negative x, y stuff. It's based on the change of the value of SB and SA or whatever else you have. Make sense? Now, for acceleration, this is the equation we had, right? The equation for velocity was VB plus SA VA divided by S A square plus D zero square equals zero. For acceleration, we're going to get the time derivative. Okay. And I want you guys to do this as a bonus problem. Okay. So acceleration part will be bonus problem. And you have to do it by end of the day today, okay? 
I will post the submission link sometimes later today. Technically, you have to take the time derivative, substitute the values, and get the number. But I want you guys to do these derivatives and practice that at home so you get more fluent in doing that. Any question about this example? Okay. Let's go back to the slides and finish this chapter. The last part of the, the chapter is relative motion. In some cases, which could be a lot of cases actually, when you analyze the motion of a particles, you are not standing on a fixed coordinate system and you are observing that from a moving coordinate system. So technically, your coordinate system moves with, 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 with its own velocity and acceleration. So what you read there is not accurate, right? It's not absolute, let's not, not call it accurate. It's not the absolute motion. Here we learn how to relate absolute motion to the relative motion. If you look at here, I want you guys to just pay attention to this slide. This is a fixed coordinate system, someone standing here. This is a moving coordinate system with, with its own path of motion, particle A or person A. And this is the particle of interest moving on path B. Now, from perspective of the fixed observer, this is the position vector that he sees. So technically, if we take the time derivative of RB, we're going to get the absolute velocity VB. And if you do it one more time, you're going to get the absolute acceleration AB. But from the perspective of this guy, this is the vector he sees. So what he sees as velocity is not the time derivative of RB, is the time derivative of RB respect to A and the second derivative for acceleration. An example of this could be, I always give this example, you are sitting in an airplane, you know, flying in the air with five, 600 kilometer an hour, right? And you see the flight attendants moving through the aisle, I don't know, giving glass of water to someone or giving lunch or dinner or something. When you sit at your chair, at your seat, you don't feel your own motion, right? You see the person walking in the aisle, for example, with three miles an hour speed. Is the actual speed of that guy three miles an hour? If someone is on the ground, how they see that person? That person moves with the airplane with 600, I don't know, kilometer an hour, and then walking with another few meter per second, right? So that's the actual velocity, but you don't see that five, 600 kilometer an hour because you are moving with that. This is how relative motion works. Is this example clear to everyone? Right? So another example, you are in a city bus, you know, bus moves in the streets and someone walks in the aisle. From your perspective, that person that walks again has like regular walking speed which could be like three miles an hour but if someone is standing on the side of the road they see that guy walking and the whole bus is moving with i don't know 30 miles an hour right so the overall speed from the perspective of someone standing and that someone standing is this guy you are sitting in a bus or this guy and this is the person walking so it's important to get the absolute motion now, if you look at this coordinate system, this is the fixed coordinate system. This is the moving coordinate system. This is the position vector for moving coordinate system, RA. This is the position vector for the particle of interest. And RB respect to A, that's how we call it, RB respect to A, is the position vector of B with respect to person sitting on A. So this is the relative position. 
how we can relate these three vectors together? Simply, we can add them as vectors, right? You may see that Ra plus Rb respect to A is going to be Rb. Do you remember this vector addition? Eh, you guys don't remember nothing, right? It's it's always interesting that I always joke that the students reset their memory like to back to zero when they finish the semester and then you have to remember everything. Hopefully, some of the things you learn here will stick in your head because you're going to use it later. So if that's the case, you can write the vector summation RB is RA plus RB respect to A, right? And these are vectors. It could be three-dimensional X, Y, Z. It could be in plane only X and Y. It doesn't matter. How we find the velocities, Kelly? If I want to find the velocity relation, how do we do that? Would you just take the time derivative? Exactly. We take the time derivative of this. RB, the time derivative is going to be VB. RA, the time derivative is going to be VA. And RB respect to A is VB respect to A. This is the velocity you see when you are in an airplane and someone walks through the aisle, right? For example, two miles an hour, three miles an hour. This is your velocity in the airplane, which could be five, 600 miles an hour. And this is the velocity of the walking person from perspective of someone standing on the ground, right? How we find accelerations, one more time, we do the time derivatives. VB becomes AB, VA becomes AA, and VB respect to A becomes AB respect to A. So technically, the absolute acceleration of B is equal to absolute acceleration of A plus acceleration of B from perspective of A. These are very simple equations. We're going to use these equations later in chapter 16 to create more complicated equations for analysis of other objects. Any question? It's clear? OK. We're going to do one simple example here. Two planes, A and B, fly at the same altitude. So it's like a two-dimensional motion. They are in the same plane. Their velocities for A is 600 mile an hour going with this direction. And B, 700 miles an hour going this direction. Sorry, kilometer an hour. The angle between the path of motion of the two planes is 35 degrees. You want to find the relative velocity of plane B respect to A. And this is like an action movie that planes coming to collide. They don't have to be close to one another, obviously. They may not reach this point at the same time, right? This may pass and that may pass. So that's, I just want to remind you, it's not necessarily bringing the collision, but So this is path of motion for one plane. This is path of motion for another plane, right? So this is like, and my airplane drawing is not the best, but it's OK. This is A, this is B, this is 35. The magnitude of velocities are given as VA, 600 kilometer per hour, 
VB 700 kilometer per hour. And we are looking for VB respect to A magnitude. Well, the equation was easy, right? VB as a vector is VA plus VB respect to A, right? If I want to do that, I'm going to draw the vectors. I'm going to use the same color for each of them. So VA is 600. And I try to make it scale. So this goes to 600. So this is going to be your VA. This is my origin that I add the vectors point O and VB goes to the left. I may have to move this a little bit. This is VB, right? The relative velocity obviously connects the end of the two vector. I'm gonna ask you a question when I draw the line. So let's say and this is not as accurate, but should be okay. This is going to be VB respect to A. The question is, is it going to go this way or this way, to the left or right? And I want Colin to answer that question. Would it be going to the left because B has a higher velocity? Because of higher, if it had lower velocity, it would go to the right. Yeah. You have to look at this equation. You have to look at this equation, right? Let's just remind you the summation of vectors. When you have like vector A, I'll just put it ABC. This is vector A, and you have A plus B equals C. This is A, this is B, this will be C. Remember, when you add vectors, the next vector starts from the end of the other vector and goes forward, right? So because VBA is added to A, its end goes from the tip of A and it tips goes the other side. So technically, if that's the case, this is going to be the direction of the vector, right? This plus this equals that. So it's not about size, it's about how you add the vectors. Your answer was correct, but I want to clarify. Now, how do you find this magnitude? If this angle is 35, oops. If this is 35, this angle is going to be how much? 145, <coughs> right? Now, how do you, how we find the value of VBA? It's like a triangle. You find the side having the other two sides and angle, right? So VBA. The magnitude is going to be a square root of VA square 
plus VB square plus 2VB VA cosine theta. Now, I'm going to put plus minus. You guys tell me, should this be plus or minus? Don't remember. I think it should be minus. Minus is the right one. And if you do that, VBA, you guys calculate this for me and give me the number. I think you should get something like 12, 14.2 mm -hmm. kilometer per hour. <clears throat> right? Yeah. That's how <clears throat> you do it. <clears throat> any, que any question about this? Sorry. I think. <clears throat> Any question? Um, so that negative, is that just the actual formula or is there something in there that led you to know that that should be negative? No, it's in the formula. <clears throat> okay. When you find, <clears throat> now let me explain this to you. If you have two vectors, this is like A and this is B, and you want to add them together. Do you remember how you find the addition? And let's say this angle is theta. To find the addition, we would use kind of like a parallelogram, drive a line parallel to B, drive a line parallel to A. This is going to be C. Now C is A plus B, right? If you want to find the magnitude of C, <clears throat> C is going to be a square root of A square plus B square, <clears throat> excuse me, plus two AB cosine theta, and this is your theta, right? When you have a triangle, right, A, B, and C, and the angle here is theta. So this is for vectors. This is for triangles. Okay. <clears throat> then C is going to be a square root of A square plus B square minus 2AB cosine theta. <clears throat> okay. In this case, okay. We literally have a triangle. You have two sides, the angle between them, and you want to find the third side. So that's why we went with this equation. This is something from your, 
I don't know, high school, middle school? Long time yeah. ago. Did you answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Now, let's go back to the slides. We are practically done with this chapter. Um, I'm gonna give you three minutes of break so we, you can kind of refresh your memory and then we start the new chapter, okay? So we're gonna be back at 10.50 and then we're gonna start chapter 13.
Okay, <clears throat> we're back. By the way, I had forgotten to upload the PPT slides for chapter 13. I did it for 13 and 14 and 15. So by up to the end of particles, we have all of them. I don't know if you guys print it or just save it and look at it on your screen, but it's there. I also created a link for submission of the bonus problem for today. The deadline is today midnight, so just make sure you do it before it's done. And now let's go back to the next chapter. So in chapter 12, we talked about the motion of a particle. We started from the simplest motion geometry, which was a straight line, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> then we talked about curvilinear motion. We used three different coordinate systems and we analyzed the motion. We never said why the motion happens, right? <clears throat> particle moves with this velocity on this path and you know with this position as a function of time or x or y and z and we did the derivatives and found velocity acceleration in this chapter we're going to talk about what causes the motion actually <clears throat> in the next three chapters we talk about the cause of motion first we talk about newton's second law i'm going to briefly explain three of them here because you know the, the fundamentals from your physics then we talk about work and energy method and then we talked about impulse and momentum each of them would approach solving a problem from different perspective and each of them will be suitable for particular type of problem as we see later okay <clears throat> so this chapter is about newton's second law we're going to learn, of course, review the Newton's laws of motion. We talk about major forces that acting on particles that will include friction, elastic force. <clears throat> Remember, anytime you apply a force to a particle, you push it, you pull it, you force it to the left and right. We call all of them as external forces. <clears throat> the physical forces that usually applied is elastic force friction, and gravity, right? We are not talking about electromagnetic forces and atomic forces and things like that. This is just simply mechanics. So we talk about this kind of mechanical forces. Then we write the equations of motion that depends on forces. Because we had three different Cartesian, three different coordinate system analyzing the motion, Cartesian, normal, transition, polar. When we analyze the forces, we can use any of these three. So we're going to review these three uh, systems and develop equations that relates forces to, to the motion. Any question about this? Okay. First, a quick review of three laws of uh, motion from Newton. The first one, which is technically for statics, you guys have passed the statics, I suppose, like maybe last spring or fall or recently, right? So the first law talks about if there's no external forces acting on a particle, it will maintain its velocity, right? Or the way that it expressed by Newton, the velocity of particle can only change if you apply force. If there's no force or the summation of forces acting on a particle is zero, then it's going to be static. Either it doesn't move or 
moves on a straight line with constant velocity. The second law talks about creating acceleration. The summation of all forces acting on a particle is proportional to the acceleration of the particle, right? And we write it with this like summation of forces is equal to mass times acceleration. Remember, force is a vector. Acceleration is a vector. Mass is a scalar. So technically, you have a vector equation. Because you have a vector, you can divide it into different components, x, y, z, normal, tangential, polar, or whatever. The third law says for any action or for any force, there's a reaction which is the same magnitude but in opposite direction. You have seen the first and third and used it frequently in statics, right? And second one, you know it from your even high school. You guys covered this in high school, right? Okay, so this is just basic. We also talk about uh, briefly a Newton's law of gravitation attraction. It expressed that any two object which has a mass, right, will create or will we have an attractive force between them because of Newton's third law the force M1 acts on two and M2 acts on M1 are gonna be opposite and equal, you know, action reaction. And the force comes from this equation. It's proportional to the masses, inversely proportional to the distance square, and you can create an equal function using this G turning proportionality to equality. And G is a constant, is a universal, physical constant, constant of gravitation, which is this much. Technically, if you consider M1 as mass of Earth and R as the radius of Earth and G is which is constant, if you put mass of Earth, radius of Earth and G here, and this is the mass of a person, this will be the weight. So technically M1 R squared G all together, if this is mass of Earth and radius of Earth, this all is going to be 9.81, the gravitational constant. We're not going to talk about, by the way, there's a section in this chapter that talks about, you know, satellites and motions like that, that uses this. I usually do not cover it. So we're not going to cover that part. It's just the particles. That's more for like aerospace stuff. And we don't get time to finish it, so we're not going to cover that part. Now, the force is acting on a particle. When you have dynamics, even statics, same, but for a statics, acceleration is zero, obviously. When you have a dynamics problem, there are different forces that are acting on a particle. One type is, as we call it, external. Remember, Every force is external. Nothing happens inside the particle, right? But we separate all the pushing and pulling and stuff like that as external force, right? Then we have reaction forces, which is also external force. Then we have friction force that we briefly talk about it. You know what friction means. Resistance to the motion between the two surfaces. Then we have gravity, which is also external force, but because it specifically is like mg mass times gravitational constant, we separate it. And we have elastic force that comes from springs. Again, all of them are external forces, but these three, bottom three, you have some equations for them. Reaction forces comes from Newton's third law and everything else goes as external force. Any question about this classification? You're good, okay. Friction. Before we move forward, I wanna ask you so who can define what friction is and what causes the friction. You guys remember from your physics or high school or something?
What causes friction? Resistance to movement uh, due to the surfaces touching. Due to surface? Yeah, surface uh, like texture or mu. Roughness, right? Right. Yeah, that's that's a good definition. Remember, no matter how smooth the surface, like I, I know you all have a disc in front of you. Touch the disc, it looks very smooth, right? But you, if you look at it in a, under the microscope, the surface kind of looks like this. It's up and down, right? It's bumpy and wavy. If I put a book, my laptop, my cell phone on top of this and try to push it to move, the surface of that things is also have some roughness. So when these things move around, I don't know if you can see my hands, this bumps and holes kind of jump into each other. And as you move, these things kind of create a little resistance. Of course, this is not this big, right? If it's this big, you can't even move it. But if it's a small, they jump over each other and the force that the tips apply on one another, those forces are added together and creates the friction, right? That's why when you make the surface smoother, you reduce the size of these bumps and holes, the friction decreases. Or if it creates, put a lubricant like a grease or oil or something, they even don't come, they kind of stay away from each other, right? And they move like that. So it decreases the value of friction. Now, based on what we just talked about, friction, first of all, if the two things move on top of each other, we call it kinetic friction. If the two things don't move off top of each other, we call it the static friction. Imagine you have a big, I don't know, desk or a drawer or something, and you want to move it and you push it as hard as you can, you push and it doesn't move, right? What resists that motion? The friction between drawer and the ground. As soon as it starts moving, then you call it kinetic friction. Fundamentally, they are the same, but kinetic friction is a slightly smaller than static friction. One more thing to remember, friction as you see here and here depends on two parameters, the surface roughness, and when you say surface roughness is the surface of the two you know, objects on touching each other on a top of it, one another. And the other one is normal force, right? As you, why normal force increases the friction? Because these bumps and holes get more engaged and it's harder to move, right? You, ap you apply the normal force, you put them more inside one another and it's harder to move. I'm sure you remember this from your physics. So for kinetic friction, the equation is the same, mu, which is a friction constant or friction coefficient times normal force. For static friction, we use mu s, but there's a little trick here. How much is, if I ask you, let's put it this way. You have a big drawer and you want to push it. I am not very strong and the most force I can apply is maybe like 50 Newton. I push the drawer by 50 Newton. How much is the friction force? Does the thing move or no? How much is the value? I push the drawer by 50 Newton and it doesn't move. How much is the friction force? Uh, 50 Newtons. 50 Newtons, right? Because they balance each other. Now, for example, Ricardo comes and he's stronger than me. He pushes the drawer by 100 Newton and he's not moving. How much is the friction force then? 100 Newtons. 100 Newtons. Now, we ask Aaron to come and help us, three of us forced together, and you reach like 300 Newton, and finally, the drawer start moving. How much is the friction force then? Less than 300 Newtons. As, as soon as, it, that's, I, I like the answer, as soon as it starts moving, that is the maximum static friction force requires, right? So the equation you see here, mu s times fn, is the maximum friction force. If it's not moving, we don't know how much the friction force is. 
right? It could be 10, 15, depends on how much we, we push, right? As soon as it start moving, right at the moving edge or border, this is your friction force, mu s times k. Is the concept clear? So when it's moving, there's a relative motion all the time. The friction is mu k times n. When it's not moving, it depends on how much you push, and that will be friction force, right? OK. And remember, friction force always opposes the motion. And as you see in some examples, mu k is usually slightly smaller than mu s. In the problems that you solve either, you know, in a quiz, an exam, or like homework, if it doesn't specify, you can consider kinetic and static friction as the same. Use the same mu. But if it says kinetic friction is this much, static friction is this much, then you have to use their own values. Does that make sense? Okay. So this is about friction. I try to show you how the friction works. I don't know how clear you can see. There's an object here, right? I'm going to push this with the blue force, and the friction is green. So we start from zero. I increase my forces. It's not moving, right? And remember, blue F and FF are equal if it's not moving. So as I increase my forces, it goes on 45 degree until it reaches the maximum static friction. And as soon as it starts moving, as I said, it drops a little bit and then friction force is gonna be constant. So let's see how it works. See, the force increases, increases, doesn't move. Right after here, it starts moving, right? One more time. Yes. Equal blue and green and equal. And then the friction is going to be constant. This is the maximum static friction force. And this is the kinetic friction force. And then you see this force doesn't increase anymore. I hope, did you, could you guys see the animation? Yes. Okay. So that's how it works. Now, again, Note that mu s because people sometimes make students sometimes make mistake static friction they put this number this is the maximum right and remember maximum static friction is usually bigger than kinetic friction sometimes we neglect the difference sometimes we don't that is what let me ask you a question you guys all drive cars right you know your cars has this abs system in the friction, in the, in the brake. Do you know what ABS means? Anti-lock braking system. Why, why we have it? To uh, keep the tires static as they brake instead of sliding across it. Practically, what you try to do with ABS, because you see, the, if, the, if the tire locks, then it's gonna slide on the surface of the road, right? It's gonna be kinetic friction. But when it rolls, it's a static friction. So you try to keep your friction in this range so you create a larger forcing at a braking forces, right? You never wanna lock the tires to come down to this level. If you need really large forces to stop, you wanna stay up to here. In tires, technically it's not a straight line, a straight line. It's kind of like a curve going here and goes down. So you want to keep it at the peak of that curve. And that's uh, what ABS controller does, right? Try to keep it on the top, the highest magnitude of friction force you can have. So maximizes your braking force. Another mechanical force that we deal with very frequently is the force of a spring. <clears throat> Hopefully you guys remember from your physics or back from high school maybe that when you compress or stretch a spring, 
the force is proportional to number uh, to the magnitude of the formation, right? This X shows the amount of the formation of the spring, either compressed becomes a smaller or stretches becomes larger, and K is stiffness constant or a spring constant. So practically, the force of a spring linearly changes with its deformation. So as you push and it stretches, the spring force becomes linearly bigger. <clears throat> right? Remember, if I stretch the spring, the force acting on the spring is the blue one. The force that the spring acts on the block is the green one. Now, you guys tell me, is the friction force in the direction of motion or opposite direction of the motion? Opposite. Opposite, right? Because the force acting on the spring is obviously blue one in the direction of motion. The force that the springs applies on the object is in the opposite of direction. That's why we usually consider as minus K. If the minus and plus confuses you, you can simply look at how a spring is stretched or compressed and put the force just like that. Oops, sorry. Okay. And one more thing to remember, springs have masses, right? Like anything has mass, right? And as it moves, the mass of a spring also has velocity acceleration, right? If you consider that velocity acceleration into equation, it becomes kind of complicated. In many applications, the mass of a spring is much smaller than the object that the spring is attached to, right? So we can neglect the mass of a spring. I'm going to give an example. You have four springs under your cars, right? One under each tire. How much the spring could weight each of them? Maybe five, six, seven pounds, right? How much force is applied on each of the tires? Imagine you have a car, the weight of the car is 2,400 pounds, which is kind of regular small sedan car, right? If you equally divide 2,400 into four tires, each of them gets 600. Now, you have 600 mass going up and down, and then five pounds of the spring is almost more than 100 times, right? So if you neglect the mass of a spring, it doesn't create big error. That's why in every problem we solve here, we neglect the mass of a spring. Any question? Are we good? Okay. Anyone does not remember free body diagram? The third force that we talk about is gravity. I think gravity is quite clear, like weight is M times G, mass times G. So I even didn't put it here. Um, anyone does not remember free body diagram? You can raise your hand. That's okay. If you don't remember, I'm going to explain it anyway. You all remember? We can skip this part. But you have no energy to talk. Aaron, do you remember that thing? For the most part, yeah. Yeah. Hi, Z. What is free body diagram? I think it's a, it's a diagram that shows all the forces in a simple picture. Exactly. So when you analyze, statics or dynamics of a system, you isolate a single part, single object, single, as we call it here, particle, right? Because we can write the equations for one particle at a time. To be able to do that, you have to separate that particle from the environment, but you have to put the effect of environment, right? If it's a pushing, if it's a pulling, it's a friction and normal force and reaction force, all of that, it has to be there. So, uh, Free body diagram actually creates a diagram 
that shows all the forces acting on the body. For example, let's say this kind of bluish object is like a potato shaped things is here. Is connected, it's not connected, it's touching a wheel here. There's a, some moment applied on the wheel. There's a force here. And then we want to do the free body diagram for this guy. So what are the forces acting here? One of the forces, obviously, this external force F, right? I can put it here. What else? If it's vertical, there's a gravity, right? You can put it there. At the contact of this wheel with this blue stuff, there's a normal force between them, right? If the surface is not smooth, there's also friction force. Now I'm gonna ask you this question. If the wheel rotates counterclockwise, should I put the friction to the right side or to the left side? To the right. To the right. How about to the left? Remember, if you look at the wheel, if the wheel rotates this way, it tries to push the potato shaped guy to the left side, right? Yeah. Can you visualize it? So the friction that the wheel applies on the blue object is from right to left. The reaction of that, <clears throat> that potato applies to the wheel is gonna be from right to left. You may have to practice this. It may require little visualization, but you cannot get the friction wrong. <clears throat> You remember in the statics, if you cannot determine the direction of a force, you can assume positive or negative as you solve it. If your number is positive, your direction was right. If your number was negative, your direction has to be the other way, right? You can do that with some of the forces, but not the friction. Friction has to be correct. So if the wheel rotates this way, you see at this contact point, at this contact point, if the wheel rotates, tries to pull this blue object to the left, right? And that is the friction force that you can see here. Try to pull it to the left. Any question? Is it clear? We may have to practice you know, a couple of times, but that's how you do it. You have to understand how the two surfaces Imagine you see, I don't know if you can see my hands. If it goes like this, right? The friction applied to the upper hand is this way. The friction that upper hand applied, you see, if my upper hand moves my lower hand, it's gonna go this way, right? You see, I'm gonna yes. put it down and push it this way. So technically, the force that pushes my lower hand this way is the friction. So the friction has to be this way. That's how you do it. What else we have here? We have a pin here. So we're going to have reaction forces here. I don't know which direction. I can just go Rx, Ry, positive, negative, doesn't matter. As I said, when you solve the problem, if one of these numbers turned to be negative, that means the force had to be other way. And of course, if this is in a vertical plane, you're going to have the friction force. Uh, sorry, the, the gravitational force, mg, going down. This is the free body diagram for this guy. I got the interactions here. I got the interactions here. The interaction of this object with, with gravity, with Earth, is gravity. I put it here, an external force. Anything else left to add? Okay. One of the things that you need to also add when you do the free body diagram is your coordinate system. Because you see, I put Rx and Ry here already. That means this is X direction, this is Y direction. But if I don't put my coordinate system, how do I know 
what is x and what is y, right? Because remember, your coordinate system doesn't have to be horizontal, vertical all the time. Depend on the problem, you can put it this way, you can put it that way. X could be vertical, Y could be horizontal, you know, it depends on the problem. So when you do that, it's good to have your coordinate system also added so we know this is also a now complete. I know when I say RX, okay, this is X direction. When I say RY, this is technically negative because it's going down, the positive Y is up. My friction force is a negative X. My normal force is positive Y. Mg is negative y, and this force you can divide into x and y component, both of them will be negative. So when you have your coordinate system, you can divide your forces and get positive negative values. Any question? Okay. I'm gonna do a very simple problem here to show you how the system works. I'm sure you all can do it. Imagine you have a slope, a ramp here with the angle alpha, and you have a box here. And when you put the box, box moves with constant velocity down. You want to analyze this dynamically. What is the first step to do here? Andrew, if I want to solve this, what is the first step? Um, I like to find the um, forces, so the force of gravity, uh, the um, how much it's sliding down the plane, and just have it all set up, and then um, setting up the forces. We just called it something like a few seconds ago. What is called? Free body diagram, right? So remember. Always the first step is free by diagram. I'm going to put this guy here. I'm going to have the force of gravity. What else? Friction. Friction. When this goes down, friction is to the bottom right or the top left? Top left. Top left because it opposes the motion. And also we have the normal force between the two surfaces. So this is the free, this is the free body diagram. Is it complete now? Anything missing? Nothing missing. Cristobal, anything missing here? Coordinates. Yes, coordinate system. Should I put X and Y horizontal and vertical or another way? In the direction of for or friction and normal force. In the direction of motion, it would be nice if I can put my coordinate system this way, right? So the motion is in X direction and nothing moves in Y direction. So now it's complete. If I want to write the equations of motion, in x direction, I have friction force. Technically, this should be negative. This should be positive. You see, mg, I can divide it into x and y. The x component is going to be mg sine alpha. The y component is going to be mg cosine alpha. And if you solve these things, now, how much is friction force? Is it a static or kinetic friction? Kinetic. Kinetic, because it's moving. So I can put mu n, sorry, mu k times normal force. And if you solve that, you get your mu k equals ton. You know what? I, I give you guys like two minutes to solve this problem. Write it down. Substitute friction force with mu k times n and find the value of alpha.
So let me get to the tablet so it might be easier to write down and get all the steps. So this is the free body diagram, right? I divided my gravitational force. Let me replace it with the red so I can move this down. Right, this is mg. This is the x component of mg. This is the y component of mg. If this is alpha, this is also alpha. So in x direction, summation of forces are zero. So you can write simply mg sine alpha, which is positive, minus friction force equals zero. And in y direction, fn, which is positive, minus mg cosine alpha equals zero. So from here, you're going to get fn is mg cosine alpha and from equation one you're going to get friction force which is mu k times fn equals mg sine alpha or mu k is mg sine alpha divided by fn you're going to put this guy here You cancel this too. So your friction force is tan alpha. That is how you can experimentally determine the friction coefficient. You put something on a slope, you start tilting it a little bit. Because the static friction is a slightly bigger than kinetic friction, you tap it a little bit. So it jumps. As soon as it starts moving, you measure that angle and you can get mu k, right? So this was very simple, no acceleration. So just to show you how things work. Any question? Now let's do this example. You have a crate here, 50 kilogram starts from rest, you pull it upward through this slope. You go six meters up in four seconds. We want to find how much force we have here. And the coefficient of kinetic friction is 0.4, sorry, 0.25. Remember, we start analyzing this right at it moves, right? So we neglect the initial part, the static part. I give you a few seconds to write this down and then do the sketch myself and we see how it goes. So how do we solve this problem? What is the first step? Free body diagram. Exactly, free body diagram.
So mass is 50 kilogram and mu K is 0.25. It goes distance of S equals to six meter in time of four seconds. And we're looking for how much force can do this. Okay. Uh, let's switch to the tablet. So this is a problem, right? I'm not going to redraw this. I'm going to just put the free body diagram here. If that's the case, I will have gravitational force going down like this. Right? What else I have? Force of friction going force down. Force of friction goes down. So I'm going to have force of friction going this way. What else? Normal force going up or out. Normal I guess. force perpendicular to the surface, right? What else? Is my free body diagram complete now? Um, you have to put your uh, Cortesian coordinates, coordinates, system. coordinate system up. Um, I'm gonna go with this system. Obviously, this this looks easier because it goes with the direction of motion, right? So if that's the case, by the way, I appreciate William responds very frequently, but I want everybody else to do the same, right? Not that you talk less, but this is not a big deal. I know these are simple, most of you know it, but believe me, sometimes you say something and if it's not right, if I correct you, it's gonna stick more in your head. So make sure you also contribute to this, you know, simple discussions we have or ask the, the question or as you can answer. Now, we have the free body diagram. I'm going to have summation of forces in X equals M A X, right? And summation of forces in Y equals what? M A Y. How much is A X and A Y? Zero. Both of them zero? Remember, this is starts from rest and moves up oh. some distance. So in Y direction is zero because it's not gonna go up and down. Of course, this is not happening, right? So this is gonna be zero, but AX is not zero. We need to find it actually. Now. If that's the case, I'm going to rewrite this equation. In x direction, I'm going to divide the components one by one. I use their own color. So for p, we have this component as px. And we have this component as PY, right? So PX is simply P. Can I just write the number? If this is P and this is 30 degree, so PX is going to be P cosine 30. Then I have the gravitational force again in X and Y direction.
This is the component of force in X direction. So I'm gonna use this their own color. When I write the equation, I use the own color so you can follow. So you're gonna be minus mg cosine 30. Remember, this 30 comes from here. That 30 comes from here. So they don't have to be the same. In this problem, like accidentally, both angles are the same. It could be different, right? And then I have friction force. Minus, how much is friction force? It's kinetic. I can write mu k times fn, correct? And that will equal to m a x. Do I miss anything? I have four forces, P, mg, friction, and normal force. Three of them had X component. I put it here already. Now in Y direction, I have P sine 30. The gravity in Y direction is also negative, minus mg. Sorry, this has to be sine. Why I put cosine? Yeah. This is supposed to be sine 30. It's going to be cosine 30. There's no friction. And then we have plus Fn. And this will be equal to zero, right? Okay. From this part, I can calculate Fn. And then substitute in the top equation. So this is equation, let's call it equation one and equation two. This was equation two. Now I'm going to write equation one. I'm left with one equation right here because I used the second equation already. How many unknowns we have here? P is something I don't know. Right? What else I don't know here? Do I know AX? Two unknowns, one no. equation. How I solve this? I need one more equation. Where do I get it? I want you guys to pay attention to this part. It says the box travels the distance of six meter in four seconds. It starts from zero velocity at rest. So can I get something here? Average One, acceleration. Find the acceleration. How I'm gonna do that? So from technically we have some information about kinematics, right? S is going to be what? V zero T plus half A T square, right? And then this is zero. So technically your 
AX is going to be Q SX by T square. If I put the values of six and four, you have two times six divided by four square. Correct? Yep. So now if you have it, then equation one only has one unknown. I'm going to take the P's at one side. You have one P here, one P here. So if you go back to equation two, I'm going to get P times cosine 30 plus mu sine 30 is equal to M AX. I'm going to put this guy to the right side plus mg sine 30 correct and i also have plus mu k mg cosine 30 so i took this term and this term to the right hand side i kept these two terms together factor p so finally, if you solve this, your P is going to be MAX plus MG sine 30 plus mu MG cosine 30 divided by cosine 30 plus mu K sine 30. Can someone get this number for me, please? I think you all should do it, but. Any number? Six hundred and fifty three point six. Six hundred Newton? Uh, six hundred and fifty three point oh, six Newton. You guys get the same number? I got 392.46 or 47. 0.5, let's just round it to 0.5. Anyone else got something, one of these two? Jake, did you get anything? We have two Jake here. I got 392 as well. Maybe this is right. We get one more 392 and then we're going to establish that one. Yeah. 
Ricardo, Heisey, Yoon, you guys, Yi Yang. I also got 390. 392. Okay, so yes. that's the you find out what you may have done wrong. So that's how you get the force, right? 392.5 Newton. If you have a force of this much, you're gonna have acceleration of 0.75 that we got here. And it you, in, in four seconds, you can take the whole thing up by six meter, right? Any question about this? So this doesn't seem to be very complicated again, but we're gonna do other problems that may be different, specifically when we go to normal tangential or polar. But we practice this free body diagram dividing the forces into perpendicular directions and stuff like that. I'm sure you have done enough of it in your, uh, what's called statics. So that's how we do it. Okay, it's um, 1148. I'm gonna stop it here. Let me just get the screenshot of the class. I think everybody's here, but just for the attendance. Um, I just checked a few of you guys didn't do the bonus problem, the first bonus problem. I don't know what the reason is, but I highly recommend you guys to spend this few minutes and do them because as we move forward, that could come very handy in your final grade. It could change your grade by one letter. Remember, if you get enough of that, we, I may add up to 5% for the bonus, 5 6% for the bonus. And 5% extra could easily change your grade from C to B, B to A, or whatever else. So I highly recommend you to do that. The other thing is we have a due date for homework tonight. And on Wednesday, we have a quiz. The quiz will pop up right at 10 a.m. So when you open your Blackboard, I probably open a new folder for tests if it's not already there. The quiz pop up right at 10. I give you whatever time I haven't designed it. Let's say like 15 minutes, right? If the solution time is 15 minutes, you get five minutes extra to scan your solution and post it online. After that, up to five minutes, I accept late submission with penalties like 10% per minute or something. And after that, I will not accept submissions, okay? Please do not use that five minutes of submission for your solution. Usually the time I give you is fairly enough if you know what you're doing, right? You may use a couple of minutes of that, but if you go behind that deadline, submission deadline, it will be penalty. And if it's a little late, you can't even submit it, okay? I suggest everybody be here in the room a couple of minutes, or maybe five minutes earlier on Wednesday. I'm going to explain this again, okay? So you can start. Because this is online, it's open book, open notes, open everything. There's nothing I can control, right? But please practice. Just because it's open note doesn't mean that you can open your notes and start reading and you know comparing this problem to that problem because dynamics is not like that. Right. There's a lot of variety of problem solving techniques you need to practice. <clears throat> so please make sure you do your homeworks, you do practice. If you need my help, you can email me. We can meet by Zoom and add this to your questions. Is the good plan? Okay, thank you all. And I see you on Wednesday, maybe 9.55 or something. Okay, goodbye.